Um, this is your first time to really see how these things are laid out and to hear some of the variation and overview uh, and background information. And so I just want to keep that in mind that right now, this is just meant to be kind of the first time through, and you'll be getting much more acquainted with each of with all of the information you're about to receive um, in our, in our for, uh, forthcoming sessions. But I just wanted to let people know um, this is just the, the your primer for these. So. Um, we'll get those out, and then we will move ahead with our next speaker. All right, and with that, I um, would like just to uh, welcome Dale Bracewell. He is going to talk with you and begin going through these, and he's the manager of transportation planning with the city of Vancouver. Oh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, it's actually my pleasure uh, to be here. So I actually want to start with a story about engagement and why I believe in this process. Uh, so I work at the city and my whole role is manager of transportation planning, so kind of in the bureaucracy. Uh, I'm essentially the project sponsor. This is the work uh, that my team does, team does in terms of uh, content. And of course, uh, we're really blessed by this great process of community panels. So, my analogy is, is towards um, what council asked us to do uh, for the Grandview Woodland Plan, which came up, which uh, Lon answered really well. We were a part of the community plan process that Tom referred to. There was a transportation plan within it. And then coming out of that, thank you, uh, is uh, council asked us to establish a Grandview Woodland Stakeholder Advisory Group. And, and our first reaction was, that's gonna take a lot of time. That's, that's kind of like something that we, we really can't do in every uh, neighborhood. Uh, but, but what was being talked about at council was, um, we've just gone through this community plan process and, and it felt like there, there needed to be a little bit more of us as staff kind of educating and teaching and or informing of kind of like, how do we go about our projects? How do we go about our, our programs? Um, and so we met uh, quarterly. It was, it was only for a few years. It actually ended at the end of, of last year. Um, but where we were kind of pushed in towards a bit of a something new and an engagement, um, and having gone to a few of those, and my team having uh, led each of those, and, and we brought in the bike share team, we brought in a transit, and we had quite a amount of the things that you're going to be able to participate in. And, and I, I, at least my assessment was, uh, it did elevate the opportunity for that community to better understand coming out of the community plan, what's transportation plan going to look like uh, in the years ahead. And so this is, this is a different process. I, I don't think we'll keep doing this as an ongoing transportation planning, um, but you're, you're involved and you're participating with us, and that's why I generally believe in the process. And I'm still optimistic that uh, we're, we're in day one, that, that there could be, yes, perhaps a consensus around uh, an arterial separated direction. But as I was said earlier, if not, all the discussion that's already started and it's gonna keep going on is gonna be absolutely beneficial to us um, and, and all the transportation planning and, and future decisions. So that's a, that's a sincere uh, opening uh, from myself. And now a bit of an apology, because I can already see it and it's just gonna get a little bit more. Um, with myself and Carol and my team who's gonna come help kind of go through all the options, it's, it's gonna feel a little bit like a fire hose. Uh, unless you are, um, and, and, and most of you I don't know, so normally I would know if you're normally involved in our transportation planning uh, decisions and processes. Uh, it's going to feel like a lot, so uh, please, please bear with us, and there'll be some Q and A. You're going to have some uh, pauses within, uh, but we're going to be around the next weekends as well. And there's opportunities in between to ask questions. Um, don't try and learn it all tonight. You're getting all these presentations, and come back tomorrow. Like come back with a few questions, uh, but there's a, there's a, there's weeks ahead for you. So I just wanted to give you that. We're, we're going to do our best to kind of make it more like a lay person presentation, but it's but it's going to be a lot. Uh, and I want to yeah. just act like echo that, but like just to take in what you can take in today. We don't expect you to walk out today as experts, and you'll there'll be we'll keep coming back to it. We'll keep touching on it. This is really just a sense chance to orient you to the presentation and one of your colleagues did request as much as possible to get access to the presentations before like uh, before you hear them so on your way out the door tonight if you want to take home the presentations for tomorrow we can make those available to you so you can kind of wade into it so um, and, and I think one last thing just to say about the kind of the amount of information you're about to get is that um, 
that no matter what, even if you had a whole day for each aspect, it would still feel like you didn't have enough time and you wanted more chance to digest it and stuff. So just take in what you can, and if you're feeling like it's a lot, then just you know be easy on yourself. Nobody's expecting you guys to be experts at all. Okay. Um, and I care about what we're doing. So normally I'm the type of presenter that actually never brings up sheets of paper. Uh, but I took notes from everything that's happened up to now, so I don't miss, I think, one of those golden nuggets that I think is going to be most helpful uh, to you. So that's kind of the reason why I've got the sheets of paper. Uh, so I guess I need to click. So what I'll be covering over myself is the transportation planning, um, how we got here, and, and just an overview of, of the options. And then uh, Carol Kong from uh, my team, Senior Transportation Planning Engineer, will uh, break, uh, break out in kind of the, the variations and, and the different uh, arterial uh, route options. Um, I also want to make sure, make sure that we're talking about an arterial and what that means. Because um, Lon mentioned it, but it was ever so quick. So what we're talking about from an arterial perspective, generally speaking, is only one travel lane per direction. And only then in the peak periods, like prior is today, that it would actually be two lanes. I just want to be absolutely clear about because I'm going to talk about growth, I'm going to talk about walking and cycling and transit. Um, and so the, we, we have city policy not to add road capacity for cars. So the arterial of a kind of capacity perspective is the same as it is uh, today. Just want to make sure that that's um, uh, clear from the start. So then back to the task. Um, Sorry, long, can you repeat the very first thing you said? The very first thing that I said? It's right here now. What is an arterial? An arterial in this case is one moving lane uh, in each direction, generally speaking, except during what we call like peak periods of day where we need two lanes. Okay, that's good. Okay, we've got some nods. All right, keep going. So Lon covered off really well like why we're talking about arterial and great separation. I want to touch on, on, the, on the other parts here and I'll get a little more into it, but it's the needs of the neighborhood, city, and the region as a whole and really like that value base but between personal um, and city. And so it's just one of the things, the nature of, of arterials is that they do more than just kind of be a part of a community. They do, they do have a city role. And especially when you start thinking of trucks and you start thinking of a bus network, um, I took the bus from North Vancouver into Vancouver. So there, there's an example of a, a serving the region, um, even though uh, getting on in my community, that feels much more like my neighborhood, right? So the context of understanding uh, the dimension that we're in, and, and I do want to acknowledge whoever mentioned, it is tension. It's a tension for us in transportation planning that we have to do this all the time. Um, it's not that simple, so um, it's a journey that you'll need to take as you, as you look at all three variables. Um, and so safe and resilient, and so of course we experienced uh, the, the resiliency of a building and coming back in uh, this morning. Um, but it is one of the benefits of not having a, a highway, um, is an arterial system. You actually have some embedded uh, resilience in, in, in terms of the network. And so a network, you know, it's like, it's a web, it's, it's got nodes, it's got, it's got links. Um, but there is a value to arterials. Sometimes arterials get talked about in a really negative way, but uh, it's, arterial systems actually is one of our best traffic calming of neighborhoods tools. By the cars that do want to get through neighborhoods, if we actually have a functioning arterial system in that web, in that network, it actually does the best job. There's no amount of traffic calming that we can do over the years that can do better for that, 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 um, that uh, arterial network. Now, where are we at in the process of transportation is just that first one, and that's what I'm going to focus on, a uh, plan. Uh, colleagues of mine tomorrow are going to give you at least a hint and, and a window towards what would be another phase when you get into design and ultimately later on, as Lon mentioned, years away, there'd be an implementation and construction. Um, so, so we're grounding ourselves in what we call the planning process. So, so we think of a lot of things, that, and, and they're generally speaking considerations, but it's, but it's always about moving people. And so we are very future oriented in terms of my team, we're always planning, and, and it's always about not just planning for different modes in the end, it's always planning for people, and then what modes of transportation are they actually wanting to be in, and where are their destinations, uh, with what frequency and what times of day do they want to do that. And then in an opportunity like we have in this process is to hear from the community, what are your aspirations around that? We have to get think neighborhood, we have to think city, we have to work within the region, but, but where, where when we have these projects and opportunities ahead of us, can we bring in your aspirations? The world is always changing. Um, we had a, a climate change uh, motion by council. What will, what will that mean for us in transportation? I don't even know yet, 
but as we work with you and engage with you in this process and ultimately in, in a project of the future, there's always those opportunities. And so that's kind of where, where when there's eventually an investment, all these considerations kind of come in. And of course here in this, in this process, we're talking about residents and we're talking about businesses and both are important and we need to hear those voices. Um, the other one is a bit more on the engineering side, uh, but we do consider it even a planning in the early days. You know, is there utilities um, underneath the ground? What types of soils are there? And then we've got a whole new green infrastructure team that's really trying to do better about how to manage the water in these uh, less permeable, but how do we make them even more permeable surfaces? So again, just considerations. They're never the defining things, but it is a bit of a matrix that we do in our heads and that you get to do uh, while you're enjoying this journey with us. Um, but I want to give you some hope. So, so in a process like this, like they did in Northeast Falls Creek, the roads aren't even built yet. Um, but as part of the planning process, uh, they went out to the community, the residents and the businesses, and came up with these principles. So back to that uh, bit of the, the submission that you have is like to think about evaluation criteria. So in a planning process like this, this is where principles are really helpful. And so a lot of the values that you've just uh, uh, shared can actually be then uh, put together in terms of principles that we could all move forward in terms of uh, de determining what you think is a preferred alignment. So coming back to uh, where we come from in terms of, we have to be grounded in the city policy. And as I mentioned, we're, we're a city that's growing with, with people. And so we, we are looking towards also more walking, cycling, and transit. And so as you think of this decision that you're, you're wrestling with, always be imagining more people, not more cars, we've, we've clarified what, what the arterial needs to be and can be, but we do need to be imagining more people walking, we do need to imagine more people cycling, and do more, more people on the bus, more people getting to bus stops. That, that's really important because we're, we're still a growing city. Um, and so what also I want to mention though is it's, it's the equivalent of like the, the park board. Um, when we get ready for growth, I mean there's only so much road space, um, we have to think about how we're going to use it more efficiently. Can I tell you the good news? Here's the good news. Walking, cycling, and transit are way more efficient than people in cars. Uh, so we've got, we've got a good marriage going on. Um, as we think and we get ready for that growth and you, and you help us think about that. Um, as we reallocate road space in our city, uh, we have to think more walking, cycling, and transit, and it is the, the more efficient way uh, to go. Um, from a, a goods movement perspective, I just want to make at least a plug for what, what, what rail is really good at. And from a greenhouse gas and environmental perspective, it's 10 times better than trucks in our city. So just, I know there's a, a federal, there's a port perspective, but also from our own community livability perspective, as we think about our transportation policies, um, think of that as well. And then uh, safety was mentioned there. So, so how we got here, uh, I'm just gonna jump to the slide that Lon mentioned too. Uh, so I won't go over this um, again, uh, but we're still in this, uh, this process. Um, and uh, as we mentioned, kind of have walked through and, and Tom also covered off uh, the Falls Creek Flats uh, planning process. So and again, I just wanna give you uh, the context that uh, myself personally was involved uh, with Tom and the community planning team, as was Carol. Uh, so we're very familiar with, with the area and the neighborhood. And again, in this, in this uh, process, it's, it's also those relationships uh, that Tom mentioned, you know, Northeast Falls Creek, downtown east side, and, and Grandview Woodland in terms of this area is of course connected to uh, adjacent uh, communities. Um, in that planning process, uh, again, bringing into uh, looking for people, but also looking at uh, goods. And so basically, uh, some of the, the slides that are gonna come ahead are more uh, specific to, to, to the arterial and the great separation. But again, these were, these were the earlier years of thinking for the Falls Creek Flats planning. So uh, great separation, uh, as was mentioned, where we do need to be uh, thinking of the, of the growth in the port, and again, just mentioning uh, rail as compared to trucks. Uh, so here's some uh, visuals of both an overpass and an underpass. The overpass, of course, is, is the Powell Street. Uh, that was uh, the first one coming out of the rail corridor strategy of that uh, line just referenced the BI line. Um, because of underpass, Carol will talk about that as a, as a possible opportunity. I just wanted to kind of give you at least a good visual of one uh, more recently in, in Calgary. And again, remember every time we get a great separation, that's at least one less of the kind of the noise uh, intrusions of, of rail is that you don't have to have that uh, whistling as, uh, as was mentioned earlier. So identifying uh, the route, um, and so again, in that grid and, and network or a web, um, you do need some uh, frequency of arterial spacing um, and have that resilience, and yet there, there is this flexibility of um, you know, looking from where the existing route is today uh, towards these ulterior routes, but just do, do get a context of kind of where Hastings is 
and where Terminal First is, uh, First Avenue. Um, it can all kind of work, but uh, there are some, you know, uh, the, the kind of, I guess, equal spacing would be the, the absolute most preferred from a resiliency perspective, but, as a, but of course doesn't have to, to, to be that way. We'll uh, touch more on this when, when Carol, but I just wanted to give like a preview. And so of course, you know, not all streets are equal and, and the north side and the south side of the street, in this case on Malcolm, are not the same. And so um, th there will be values, impacts, trade-offs, those kinds of words are the things that, that you will, you'll spend some time as the, as the panel. Um, so Carol will talk about kind of the, the community garden and the park on one side, and then of course the produce row and the businesses um, on, on the other. Um, and then I just again, sincerely want to say it, and I met with, uh, it was referenced earlier, you know, Strathcona residents and, and one of their community options called The Better Way. Um, we, we have embraced that, like, and, and these are part of the conversation in terms of the roots and the variations. And so um, the big picture, though, that I'm, that I'm trying to cover off is we have four overarching representations of options that have names of Pryor and, and William and then uh, a national, sorry, uh, Malcolm and then National, and then there are kind of these sub variations within that uh, mostly came from you, uh, the community, and we've embedded that into to your process. So again, we're in, we're in the planning phase. Uh, tomorrow you're gonna meet my peer, uh, Paul Storr, so he's a manager of transportation design. And so typical in a process uh, like this, um, we will go through a, a planning phase. There'll be a whole other community conversation then about uh, that streets design phase. And then once a decision is made and there's actually people that are directly impacted, there's another set of engagement, which is the uh, implementation and, and the construction. Uh, so in, in transportation planning, you, you get to these things called cross sections and you get to these things called plans. And so you'll, you'll see a lot of that and you might even be drawing some up uh, yourselves as you go along. Um, be careful, as I want to say, is I tell my team, be careful, it can be sometimes death by cross-section. You, you think you totally understand a street or a street of the future by looking at that top one. Um, in this case, I really want to highlight that an arterial in this case is literally largely defined by the curve to curve space. You and your values, again, from green infrastructure to how much you think you want to make it better for walking or cycling or in the kind of bottom left here, we're talking about transit, so when you want to have transit, you want these deluxe transit stops in other space. Um, so be careful when you look at things just from a cross-section or a plan view. Um, I mean, you have to in a planning process if you consider things, uh, but at the same time, um, spend some time uh, talking with, amongst yourselves about how you, how you really captured it. But so much flexibility is what I'm trying to also say beyond the curve-to-curve -curve dimension, and what do you aspire um, on that? And then again, the, the bottom right is just alluding to things underground do matter at times, but at this point, they're just really considerations. Um, so again, I'll sort of think of this more as a matrix and evaluation and a planning, but things that at least in engineering we need to kind of at least touch base structurally, um, soils, can you actually you know, ground something in the earth that can span so long? We just need enough technical review so that we're actually talking something about something real, so that if you guided us towards a planning a decision, we are all grounded in some truth, um, but then there's a lot again design flexibility uh, to come in these uh, opportunities. Um, Lon mentioned this, but, it's, but, but it really needs to be emphasized because we want you to have the mindset that we have if and when there's a business that would actually be impacted by any of the arterial alignment, uh, alignment options um, through council and the park board process that were mentioned that would come. Um, we care a lot about that and often it, it works out that the business is left in, in a better state. And, and if not, they are compensated. Like, Everything that we try and do is to make it, and, and that's through the whole period of construction until after. So uh, we can talk about more of those examples, but, but please um, be thinking that. The other is, is um, even the words underpasses and overpasses, and even some of the images that we have aren't brilliant. I mean, but Hastings is kind of a good example where um, the first times I went over Hastings, I didn't even realize it was an overpass. Uh, much of the built environment, and so there's all these opportunities um, in, in anything that would be new as an arterial uh, to consider how that could be integrated. And we have urban designers in our planning department that we can work with um, to, to, to show that that could be as best as it possibly can be. So again, your task, that recommending, and we talked about neighborhood, city, and region. Um, we need you to recommend the route, why you prefer it, um, uh, why you're evaluating it, and what's important. Um, and then again, thinking at that citywide level, 
Um, so please do break away from sometimes being right into kind of this, and we're right in the neighborhood, um, thinking about, okay, wait a minute, I have to picture myself as a person biking through, and, and where, where am I kind of having a lens towards that? I, I love the earlier comment, thinking about you know different different ages and different abilities um, than maybe what to, the modes that we're most uh, used to. Uh, tomorrow you're going to get a, a great overview and presentation on cost and constructability. Uh, the purpose of me just bringing it up right now is again, it is a variable in terms of that planning uh, consideration. It, it is important for us to, to think and to, to presume or not uh, whether or not there would be additional higher levels of government or other partners uh, that may want to participate in, in funding a project. The other thing that you'll, you'll need to understand and, and get, put your thinking cap like we do is as we make the case, and sometimes it is, we want to make the case for the, the higher cost project. Um, we just need to remember that when we're doing that, there are other city projects uh, that, that are also you know, part of a capital plan. So you'll learn about that um, and, and have that uh, perspective as well. So, so lastly, um, it's then going from that citywide to the local. Uh, this was very quickly mentioned and shown uh, by Tom, that you know, e each one of these land uses, each one of these uh, colors really represents a very important uh, part of how you evaluate and think about the, the arterial line options. So we've got residents, the industrial businesses, uh, Protest Row, which has been mentioned, uh, parks, uh, community gardens, the civic facilities, um, and the hospital. So um, I'll, just, I'll just leave it at that, and if there are some more questions as it relates to these, um, and then I think uh, Carol's gonna come up and start the first of the artillery. Thanks, and so before Carol, before you get up, and just in a second, but um, how we're gonna structure this is that we're gonna give a, like a nice longer piece for questions and answers after you've had a chance to hear an overview of all the presentation, but we're also gonna have a chance to digest. So the first thing I want you to do right now is grab an index card if you have any questions about what you just heard, and to write that question down. And we're gonna do this various times as we go through the overview, and then we'll just dig into it all at one time so that we can make connections between the pieces. So if you take a look at the presentation, think about what Juan just said, I'm gonna give you just you know, a minute and a half or whatever to make any notes to yourself or write any questions down. Or if you don't have any questions, of course, you can start taking a look at the presentation that Carol's gonna make in a moment. Too much. There's a lot of information that you will see 
in your resource guide there. It's about 70 pages of information that you can read through. It's your homework for the next several weeks to come. And you'll hear from other people, other um, they impact those who may be impacted on their perspectives, some of the details that they bring as well. Um, and today I'll just walk you through some of the high level highlights of each of those groups. So for each group, I'll walk you through kind of the background of why we studied it, how we looked at it. I'll explain what the group is, kind of the description of where it is, some of those impacts to adjacent land uses, and there is a lot more detail in your guide, so you can refer to that map later on. Um, focus on some of those key benefits and challenges that just to focus on for today, um, and then explain what some of those root variations are. And there will be more discussion about cost and constructability tomorrow. Um, don't worry about that now. Kind of the high level is, you know, the bigger the structure, the more engineering work's required, the higher the cost. The bigger, the more kind of impacts and the work that we have to do to mitigate those impacts so businesses can stay whole, that will lead to the cost. But just kind of let's focus on what, the, what all this is, first of all. So the first route we looked at was the Malkin route. And so this was really identified in the Falls Creek Flats Rail Corridor Strategy back in 2008. And the, one of the key reasons we looked at this is because the city has an existing right-of-way of 30 meters, which is enough space to provide an arterial with good public realm, bike lanes, wide sidewalks, and all that. Um, so as we started the Falls Creek Flats Area Plan in 2015, this was one of those routes that we studied, and we brought forward to engagement as well. So the route generally, all the routes uh, connect to Main and Pryor on the west side uh, with the new Pacific Boulevard that would replace the Viaduct Street Network. Um, they would go through the new St. Paul's um, Hospital and Healthcare Campus. The city went through a policy statement phase where we worked with Providence Healthcare to look at street networks and alignments that would work with their hospital site plan and provide a good transportation network to help service that and, and for emergency vehicles, uh, for local access as well. And so the, all the routes um, south of Pryor have that same alignment through their sites so that they could have certainty around de um, designing the hospital site with one route in that area. So then the Malkin route would continue along the north edge of Trillium Park. As Doug mentioned, when that park was designed in 2009 and 12, it kind of anticipated uh, the street right away being there. So there's a little bit of impact to the north side, uh, but there's nothing really planted there right now. It would run along the kind of existing uh, right away on Malkin, and then when you get to Raymer, there would be an intersection, and then the overpass would start ramping up. It would go over Glen Drive, it would cross the rail tracks of about 11 rail tracks of that area, cross over Vernon, and then T into Clark Drive. So we mentioned neighborhood shortcutting and the importance of protecting some of that arterial traffic from local neighborhoods. And so all the options south of Pryor would T into Clark, meaning that all, all vehicles would have to turn left or turn right. Um, they couldn't go straight through onto, into Charles and into the Brandon Woodland community. So this is a map of some of the land impacts. Again, um, a lot of this is in your guide, so please review um, as you have time. I'm gonna focus on some of those um, key, uh, key benefits and challenges. So of course with Malkin, there's the opportunity to downgrade prior to a more of a local serving uh, collector street um, and better connect Strathcona residents with the park. Um, it also uses the existing 30 meter right of way that we have. Um, and it can also provide a pretty reliable and connected street network. Um, the good thing about Malkin is that many residents and businesses are still within a five minute walk to transit. And the five minute um, kind of buffer is about 400 meters. And that's one of the guidelines that you'll hear from TransLink tomorrow about how they, tr how they plan um, local serving transit routes. Now a big challenge with Malkin has to do with what's um, in the right of way today. And so there's a very constrained area um, between Hawks Ave and Raymer Ave, uh, which is where the Cottonwood Community Gardens were actually planted within the street right away. And also products for open businesses um, use that local industrial street to maneuver the trucks back into the loading bays. And when they do so, they block uh, traffic from moving through. And it functions okay today because it is a local street. And so the, most of the people using that street 
um, would be um, the, some of those businesses um, trying to get access, and so they're, it's okay if it takes a little bit longer to get there. The other kind of challenge is that the street right now is only 12 meters wide, and there's no sidewalks. So any little change that you make is going to have an impact on what's there today. Um, there's also impacts to the trees and the forest canopy, and, and the community gardens includes um, some of those, it includes trees as well, the, uh, as well as just garden plots. The other challenges are, of course, there's parties for businesses west of that area as well, on Malkin, west of Chess. Um, well, we did some work with the community um, and the businesses earlier. Um, we looked at um, how, some of those, uh, how some of those impacts could be mitigated, and just kind of the nature of their properties and their operations, those businesses were a little easier to mitigate. And so we would continue to do that as we, as we work through the process. Um, and then, of course, there's also impacts to the local uh, businesses um, on Charles, east of the rail tracks as well. So as we progressed through this, we thought about like some of the variations that we could do on Malkin. And especially in this constrained segment between the Hawks and Raymer. So we kind of looked at it as, well, okay, so there's two sides of the street. We can either put, put the arterial further to the north, further to the south, and that would obviously have different impacts on those sides. And so we looked at a design principle for the north side, is to, <coughs> that we could minimize those impacts of Pardis Road businesses, allow them to operate as they do now, and provide a service room. And of course, by doing so, that would have that trade-off of impact to the community gardens that are in the street right away. Or, conversely, we can um, take a south alignment, and that would minimize those impacts to the Cottonwood community gardens, but then have more significant impacts to products for businesses. Alternatively, we can kind of balance those impacts. So, you know, th um, both, both kind of impacted stakeholders would need um, to be mitigated as well. And so that, because we, because the city does have a 30 meter right away, um, th there could be an option where there's no impact to Strathcona Park boundaries either. So this is just kind of a summary of, of what I mentioned now. Um, with three variations on Malkin, you'll also hear that there are different impacts to the Animal Services Facility, which is just east of Raymer at Malkin. And you'll hear more of that detail, um, I think on day four, when our facilities um, team comes in to explain that to you. So that's it for the Malkin route, that's the high level. Um, Susanna, I think we were just gonna pause after each route. We want to give you a chance to digest a little bit about what you heard, take a look at those maps, um, uh, kind of make sense of what, uh, what that description is about. So can you go over to the next slide in our deck? So we're wondering if you have questions about the route and the, um, and the structure for this alignment, this would be an overpass. Um, and we want you, again, to focus on kind of the physical elements. And um, what I'd like you to do in a moment is to turn to the person or person you in a pair or trio at your table and just talk about what you just heard, what questions you might have. Look at the materials together to try to make sense of it. So if there, you know, if you need to move your chair around to get in a pair or trio, go for it. We'll have about five minutes to digest. So go for it.